Do you guys remember my magic square from earlier? Yeah. That trick is actually one that I created myself. There's a lot of different variations of the magic square that many different performers do. But the one that I do, I, I thought of that idea myself, and I'm the only person who I know of who is doing it that way. And I brought up that idea to my dad, and he said that he thought it would be impossible. So I went up to my room that night and stayed up way later than I should, and I eventually figured out a way to do it. And you guys got to see before, I did it for you, it was possible. Uh, I actually developed a proof to show that it will always work for any circumstance that you give me. That proof will be published as a paper this March in the College Mathematics Journal. So if you really want to know how I did that magic square, pick up a copy of the College Mathematics Journal. <laughs> I love proofs. I think they're one of the most cool things in mathematics because you can say with 100% certainty that something is absolutely certain or absolutely impossible. You can't do that with any other science. Anything else you could say, oh, well, there's the possibility that something could have happened. But with mathematics, it is absolutely certain or impossible. Take this chessboard here. Would it be possible to cover the entire chessboard with dominoes, assuming with 32 dominoes? assuming that each domino covers a black square and a white square, either horizontal or vertical. Yes, you could just do four rows of eight, or eight rows of four, or a bunch of other ways too. But you only need to show one of those ways to show that it is mathematically possible. What if we were to take away two squares, say the top left corner square and the bottom right corner square? Now would it be mathematically possible to cover the remaining 62 squares with 31 dominoes? No. Sounds like you could, but there is actually a mathematical proof to show that there is no way to cover those 62 squares with 31 dominoes. It's actually really interesting. If you come up to me after the show, I'd be happy to show you how it works. It's, I think you'll find it really cool. Who here plays chess? Okay, so you guys are familiar with the knight? Okay, for anyone who isn't, the knight is a chess piece that moves in an L shape. It goes two squares in one direction and one square in another. So it might go two up and one to the right, or two down and one to the left, or one down and two to the right. There's a lot of different possibilities. So here's my question. Would it be mathematically possible to cover, to start the knight on any one square, and using legal knight moves, hit every single square on the board without hitting any square twice? In other words, start the knight on a square, and in 63 moves, cover the entire chessboard. This is a puzzle called the Knight's Tor, and it's been around for centuries. And mathematicians can show that starting on any square on this board, you can cover it in only 63 moves. And the interesting thing about that proof is they only needed to create one path that the knight takes to prove that it will work starting from any one of the 64 squares. Can I get an audience volunteer, please? Okay, you sir, can you please come on up on stage? Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> so, what I'd like you to do is point to any square on the chessboard. Okay, so, I just said that it would be mathematically possible to start the knight on this square and using legal and complete the knight's tour challenge. But I want to try something a little different. Uh, we started on a black square, so point to any white square to put this bullseye on. Okay. You may be seated. So here's the new challenge. Would it be mathematically possible to start the knight on this square and using legal knight moves, hit every single square on the board and land on the bullseye? Let's find out. At this point, I'd like to mention that uh, I'm using numbers so you can see what path the knight takes. You can see that like from one to two is a legal knight move, two to three is a legal knight move, and so on. To make sure that these are all legal knight moves, <laughs> I have the horn. So who here, is, uh, who here is familiar with chess and feels comfortable testing knight? Okay, so I want you to keep a close eye on the board, and if you see a move that isn't a legal knight move, honk the horn. That way we'll stay mathematically accurate. Okay? Okay. Good. 
was testing it there. Who here likes to run? Okay, in the year 1954, there's a man named Roger Bannister who decided that he wanted to break the world record for running a mile. Now, most track and field records get broken pretty quickly, but this one was sitting there for nine years. It was so special because it was just above the four minute mark, 401.4. So people just psychologically thought it would be impossible to run a four minute mile. But Roger Bannister decided to challenge that. He trained extra hard in practice, and practiced, used interval training, and he ended up running a mile in 3 minutes and 59.4 seconds, breaking the world record. And just 46 days later, though, John Landy of Australia beat his record, and then a bunch more people beat it. But before Roger Bannister ran that 4-minute mile, there were a lot of people that thought that was impossible. One more thing I'd like to point out. I don't know if you noticed this, but all of the odd numbered squares, all of the odd numbers are on black squares, and all the even numbers are on white squares. This is because the night, whenever it moves, it goes from a black square to a white square, or a white square to a black square. And uh, so when I said that he had to put the, six, the bullseye on a white square, I wasn't trying to cheat or anything. It was because since he put the number one, which is an odd number, on a black square, the number 64 has to go on a white square. I think that's a kind of cool mathematical identity. Who here likes to swim? <laughs> in the year 1978, a 28-year-old woman named Diana Nyad, she wanted to swim from Cuba to Florida, 110 miles. She failed. Just 33 years later, she decided to try again and failed. Then tried for a third time and failed, and a fourth time and failed. Each time failing because of things like uh, heavy storms and bad currents and jellyfish stings, crazy stuff. But each time she practiced again and then got back out there. And finally, just a few months ago, September of 2013, she tried for a fifth time. A 64-year-old Diana Nyad walked up onto the beach in Key West, Florida, after swimming 110 miles in under 50, over 50 hours, the longest any human being has ever swam. But before she did that, I'm sure there were a lot of people that thought that was impossible. Who here watches TED Talks? 
Great, I'm glad that the people who don't run or swim get a chance to participate. <laughs> I love TED Talks, and I actually learned about mental math through a TED Talk. I've been doing this show for a good four years now, and the most common question that I get asked is, when did you discover that you had this gift? And the answer is, when my dad gave it to me. Right here, this was the gift. Secrets of Mental Math, the book written by Dr. Arthur Benjamin, same guy in the TED Talk. I read the book and practiced the different techniques until I was able to do them. Now that might sound like a boring answer to you, that I wasn't born with some cool supernatural ability, but I think it is more thrilling and exciting because that means that any of you could do it as well. You just learn the techniques and you practice, then you'll be able to do almost, any, almost everything that I did in my show today. I'm not claiming that what I do is as impressive as running a four minute mile or swimming from Cuba to Florida. But Roger Bannister was not born with the ability to run a four minute mile. Diana and I have failed four times before she swam from Cuba to Florida. One of the things I'd like you to take away from this today is that with hard work and practice, each one of us is capable of doing some really cool things. Who here has been to Las Vegas? <laughs> it's really hot there, isn't it? I got to go to Vegas for the first time last summer. I was part of a magic showcase with five other performers, and each one of us got about five to ten minutes to try to entertain the audience. I did the magic square that you saw earlier, but the coolest part for me was that now for the rest of my life, I can say that I played Las Vegas. <laughs> but I was, uh, the headline performer of that night is a guy by the name of Todd Robbins. He does this really awesome sideshow act. He does things like hammering a nail into his nose and swallowing swords and eating a glass light bulb as he ate a glass light bulb live for the audience. Uh, and, but he said one thing at the end of his show that really stuck with me. I want to read this so I get this right. He said, I've tried to show you a few things that before tonight, before you walked in here, you didn't know could be done. And that idea that the impossible might just be possible is a very powerful one. The desire to try to find out what is possible in life is what motivates people to go on and do great things with their lives. Now, I didn't try to do a sideshow act for you. I didn't try to swallow swords or eat light bulbs. But I did try to show you that some things with mathematics and with your mind that you might not have thought were possible before actually can be done. Though mathematics shows us that some things truly are impossible, the human spirit shows us that almost everything else is certainly almost everything else is certainly in our reach. With hard work, desire, and determination, even the seemingly impossible can be possible. Thank you very much.